Are you interested in seeing what a Nephite city looked like? Well, I've got a really good candidate for one. Today we're going to do a virtual tour of an archeological site known as Fort Ancient. It's located in Ohio and it fits a lot of the Book of Mormon descriptions. To do a virtual tour, I'm gonna to share the screen and, and we'll look at uh, material about it. Now, Fort Ancient is one of my uh, favorite sites. It's a site that I've been to uh, several times. It fits the description in the war chapters of a fortified Nephite city. This is the time frame when Captain Moroni uh, built walls around the city. And the Fort Ancient fits that description. So come and see it with me. Give me just a second. I'll share the screen. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, a few pictures of Fort Ancient. Uh, this is an overview, sort of an aerial view of the site. Like I said, it's northeast of Cincinnati, Ohio. And there's a the little, uh, the Miami River that goes up alongside it. It's on a sort of a relatively flat uh, hill hilltop. And it's a steep, it's several hundred feet up there from the river. And, uh, and they built walls all around, all around the site, okay? Just a couple of more pictures, and then we'll we'll take a little bit more detailed look at the site. So here you can kind of get a sense of the dimensions. The the walls in some parts are up to over twenty feet tall, other parts not quite as tall. Um, the site encloses over one hundred acres, so it's a very large site. It's like a mile and a half or so from the. Uh, the south walls uh, to the to the north walls. It's about three and a half miles of earthen walls built around it. Here's an example of one of the gateways and entrances between the walls uh, to go into the site. On the site, there are a number of uh, mounds and other things. Uh, there are stone mounds. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's also other types of mounds at the site. There is a museum currently at the site. Um, this is sort of a picture of how they have uh, considered to what the, the homes or habitations looked like. The way these were built is you would take a, a uh, you know, kind of a thin uh, tree and you would bend it so it would make sort of an oval. You would have multiple of these to sort of make the frame and then uh, the holes in the top so the fire could escape. And these would be sort of multifamily or extended family type habitations. And there's, at the site, there's uh, evidence of long-term habitation over over hundreds of years. It was a habited, you know, it was, it was an inhabited site. There's lots of uh, typical Native American type artifacts there, arrowheads, uh, tools, other things like that. Uh, there's a lot of use of copper. And um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go to a site. This is uh, put together by a couple of universities. Um, Fort Ancient, along with some other Hopewell Native American sites, are uh, together a World Heritage Site. And they've done some nice uh, information about the site. And going through their information at this particular, it's called ancientohiotrail.org. And going through this, I'm not going to uh, read everything uh, time-wise. It's, it's not very efficient, but there are, uh, some of the information are contained, is contained in videos. And I will uh, play a few clips, which I think are uh, useful to go through. Okay, so this first part uh, is not uh, that useful. It's just sort of general information about the site and location. The second part uh, is interesting. So in addition to the pictures, I'm going to play a, a, a couple of clips. Uh, I'm not going to play all of the videos, but I'm going to play a couple of clips just for uh, for commentary to talk about them and for, for educational purposes. Okay, so in this first one, we're going to listen to a little bit of what they have to say here. When the northern extension was built, it included a new monumental gateway to the northeast. Here, though, there was a new design idea. The monumental gateway effect was translated into a pair of gate mounds that now were set outside the wall rather than on top of it. 
So I clicked that part because it shows uh, something that you don't see very well uh, when you're at the site, which is that it's not just the um, the walls enclosing the site, but it actually extends beyond. Let's hear a little, a little more about it. Perfect square. Outside, two low walls extended a half a mile to the northeast. Okay. When the so, northern extension. So what it had was um, at the site. Let's go back to the picture. So you have this large enclosed city area. And what they're saying is just outside of it, there was sort of a long road or path that, that extended a half mile out. And it comes kind of through this sort of a gateway into this north part of the site. And then later we'll talk about that there's also a, a gateway on the south side of the city as well. Okay, and then this one we'll talk a little bit about the stone mounds that are used and it'll talk about how they were used and show evidence that they were used to have fires on. Mounds such as these at Fort Ancient probably had many functions besides burials. In fact, very few of the mounds at Fort Ancient contain burial. They may have been used for signal fires uh, as here in the North Fort, uh, the um, uh, Moorhead in the 1890s reported that these were basically large piles of limestone that were very heavily burnt. Okay, so that's good enough on that. So we don't really know the purpose other than that they had large fires on there, could be for gatherings, could be uh, for like ceremonial purposes, uh, perhaps signal fires. He, he mentions another possibility could be something like uh, for altars or something like that. Um, there was a, in the site there, are four mounds that make a perfect square, and there was no, there are no signs of habitation on that site. That, so that um, may be a, a site for a temple or other ceremonial spot. Uh, their video on that isn't that good, so I'm not gonna play that. Uh, on the site, there are, as indicated, habitations, um, and uh, these were there over centuries also, out that northeast where there was the two um, mounds and sort of that pathway and road that goes out, you know, they, they can trace it a half mile or so. Out that direction, there are craft shops that have been set up. It's so you can tell it's it was set up that really was like a large uh, city. Also on the site, there's uh, an archaeological dig going on. They, there was sort of like a wood a wood hinge kind of thing with a post in a circle that was likely a, a ceremonial type spot or gathering spot as well. And uh, again, these the point of these is just sort of give you uh, an overview of the of the site. This uh, video has uh, an interesting part about the walls, so I'm going to play just a portion of that one. Massive amounts of earth. It's actually, we're going to jump to the, it was, I think it was at second 40, the 42nd spot. Yeah, go ahead. Perhaps most spectacularly, they constructed this huge causeway across from the South Fort to the North Fort, filling up three gullies in the process. It took an amount of soil equal to all of the site's earthen walls combined. Okay, so what they're describing is the site, um, there was a south part, this is the, the north part there, there was a south part and a north part. They uh, determined that the south part was the first part that was occupied and then apparently they needed to expand and they built this along causeway to then, then do the north side as well. And uh, the amount of earth movement to, to uh, build that causeway across, they said it was as much earth as, as doing the walls, which is incredible. Here they'll talk a little bit more about that. The most elaborate of the site's three major passages is called the Great Gateway. Opening to this narrow ridge, it is the original north entrance of the oldest part of the enclosure. Passing in and out along the ridge would have taken the ancient visitors past mounds. Actually, uh, it would have taken them past the, the habitations and stuff. Even though they have the evidence of the habitations, when they do these videos, they keep going back to 
it as a ceremonial site as opposed to a city. But crescents and limestone pavements, as if to remember the first generations of ancient ancestors, perhaps the first who made this hilltop a sacred place. Okay, and then there's a little bit more in it that I wanted to capture. So as they indicated, they have like pavements and pathways and stuff. And at several more nearby, he found many bodies in disarray, as if thrown in and buried in a hurry. I wanted that part to play because um, another thing that when you go to the site and to the museum, uh, despite it's obvious, uh, built, it, it's obviously a city, it's obviously a fortified city, it's an uh, ideal uh, natural defensive uh, location, and um, the walls are along the ridges, which would maximize for defensive purposes and not any particular you know, shape or design. So it's clearly for defensive purposes. But despite that, the museum and the mainstream archaeologists will say, no, we, we think it was a ceremonial site and, and not for defensive purposes. And I'll address that a little bit more in just a second. But just in, in mentioning the one archaeologist who found all of these um, uh, bones that uh, indicated that it's the kind of thing that would happen in a, in a war and as people were you know, conquered and abandoning the city. Uh, let's go ahead, just two more clips of this, and then I have a few slides. Okay, uh, this next part is just, you know, some of the pretty overlooks that are from the south part of the site. I do encourage you to, if you're interested in the videos, go to the, uh, to the site to look at them. And then this will sort of uh, talk about the big gateway at the south part of the site, um, which people would approach if they're coming up the river uh, to the city. All three of the major gates have similar features. A pair of mounds, together with ramps passing through a large gap in the walls. Like the Great Gateway, the South Gate opening was made higher by bringing the walls up, as if mounds were added to the top of the wall. A ramp bridges across the interior water ditch. A stone pavement stretched all the way down this steep hillside to the river, suggesting. Okay, and um, I, I'm playing these because they are the best illustration to let you sort of visualize. It's even better than when you're in there, there in person. Even when you're there in person, the, the dimensions are so large that you see the earth walls, but it's hard to sort of get that sort of visualization that uh, these videos provide. I'm going to show one last little clip and then and then um, talk about some of the other scholarly information uh, that we have about this potential uh, Nephite uh, city uh, that kind of fits the description of Moroni cities in the Book of Mormon. Okay, so in this one, we'll play just a, a couple of clips out of it. The walls are up to 23 feet tall and interrupted by 67 openings that were faced with limestone outside, perhaps one third of the way up. Soil to build the walls was scraped from the surface of the plateau or taken from the adjacent ditches or hillsides. The construction of the walls themselves was an enormous undertaking. Moore had calculated that there were over 13 million cubic feet of earth in the walls alone. Just kind of pausing for a second. So. 13 million cubic feet of earth in the walls alone. And then I think he talks about the additional amount um, in the causeway. And it's estimated that another equal amount of soil was also moved for other design purposes, like leveling hilltops or filling ravines. The whole Northern Plateau, for example, was stripped down to the clay subsoil to make it flatter and to provide material for the walls to this. OK, so not only did they do the, the walls, but the, they had clearly worked to make uh, the location flatter to make a, um, a more pleasant, I guess, city there. And um, in, in terms of the amount of earth, so then he said 13 million cubic feet for the walls, plus an additional amount about equal to that to do the causeway. So you're talking about 26 million cubic feet. Uh, each cubic foot would be like a load uh, to move and, and put in the wall. So you're talking about 
an extremely large site that would have taken thousands of workers to build unless you assume that it would have taken decades or, or give them hundreds of years to do that. Um, so if you're many times with these Hopewell sites, the museums and so forth, they'll, they don't want to accept a large city. So they'll imagine smaller populations and then, but to, to do a site like that, to have that much earth movement, if you're talking about, you know, only dozens or a couple hundred workers, you're talking about a project that would take decades or perhaps a hundred years to build, as opposed to the number of people that it would take to build in any useful time frame uh, to be useful for the people building. You're talking about it would have to be thousands of workers. So I just have a few more slides that I want to uh, look at, and then I'm also going to uh, show you uh, by Google Earth um, the site. Okay, so the first uh, key point in addressing is this a Nephite city is does it fit the right time frame? And the answer is yes. So even the museum there and also the radiocarbon dating dates it to the right Book of Mormon time frame. It shows that it was occupied from about 200 BC to about 400 AD, and that is according to the the museum and the and the carbon dating there. Again, it encloses about 100 acres, which is an extremely large site. A location or a city that side could that size could easily hold tens of thousands of people to potentially stay there. So it's a large city. Sometimes you'll see uh, people will say, "Oh, in the Heartland area, Book of Mormon time frames, there are no large cities, no large populations. It was only small villages or hunter gatherers." This is one of the sites that disproves that and shows that those assumptions are incorrect. A 100-acre enclosed fortified site. Uh, could easily encompass tens of thousands of people within a city of that size. Uh, then I have the part here about the amount of earth, which we, we've already addressed. Now, when it was first discovered, it was originally considered a large fort or a fortified city. It's just naturally, obviously, um, appears like that as the purpose for it. Um, and it shows signs of uh, habitation for years. We'll talk about the crops that are there, but nevertheless, you should know that um, many archaeolog archaeologists will insist that, no, this is just a gathering site, not a, not a large city. Some of the evidence of long-term occupation uh, comes from uh, the agricultural, what they find there in terms of crops. So I'm going to have a couple of slides on this aspect. So uh, here, these are a couple of, and this is, uh, you know, the peer-reviewed um, scientific literature, again, confirming the site. They said that they built, began to build the earth walls approximately 100 BC. And I'll just stop and point out that that's like right on target uh, for what the Book of Mormon says. With Captain Moroni, if you'll recall, when they uh, built the walls around the cities, uh, it specifically says it was done in a manner that not known before by the children of Lehi. And from the text of the Book of Mormon, that time frame when Moroni would have done that was about 70 BC, about 72 BC. So for uh, the carbon dating to come in and place it approximately 100 BC is incredibly, uh, incredibly on target um, for fitting this as a, as a Book of Mormon city for when they built those walls. In addition to having the walls, it shows that they had ponds that were deliberately constructed to hold water. And the reason why they know they were not just ditches or, or pits to hold water is that they can tell that they had moved clay to, to do a clay lined pit, which would uh, allow the water to, to stay there and not, and not seep through. So these appeared to be deliberate uh, pits and locations to hold ponds of water uh, that could be uh, used um, in the site. And then also when they look at the, the crops, the first thing that they find is some storage sites that were quite large. In fact, they found seeds in some storage pits in tens of thousands or millions of seeds. Uh, so it appeared not only that they have ponds to uh, save and hold water, but they also had storage pits to save and hold uh, food, which are the types of things that you would want 
for a large population or a city that may be under siege and is worried about uh, being attacked. And so you have your, your reservoirs for water, you have your reservoir for food, and so that you are ready to, to withstand um, uh, attacks. Okay, so it is fortified like described in uh, Miami, as I indicated, it's on a it's on an ideal natural fortification, a, a ideal natural defensive position. It's a 270 feet above the Little Miami River. And um, now, addressing one counter argument. So some archaeologists will say we don't think it was used as a fortification, and the reason that they'll usually give for that is that they say there are 84 gates or breaks in the in the walls so the walls again really large sites so three and a half mile long walls there are 84 spots where there are breaks in the walls and they say that doesn't look like fortification then if you're going to have that many gateways so that's the reasoning but in my opinion those reasons are really weak because it can be explained in multiple ways first the breaks in the walls have not been shown to have been originally there. So what you can imagine, it's very easily to see that you could have had a situation where they built the walls in a time of uh, worrying about war, and then in a time of sustained peace, like in the Book of Mormon after Christ came, where you have the hundred years of peace, where it's like, well, we don't need that anymore. And so for convenience, instead of having to go up and over the walls to get in, out of the city all the time, that they then uh, put the gateways in the walls. So the first possible explanation is that all of those gaps in the wall, those um, may have been done later in a time of extended peace after they had had a time of warfare. Another possible explanation is that there could have been towers, you know, or wooden kinds of fortifications in those spots. To my knowledge, they there hasn't been excavations to test whether there are posts that had been in the ground in those gaps between the walls. Yet another possible explanation is that uh, the ditches being inside of the walls was maybe only marginally less of defensive value than having them outside of the walls. By having them inside of the walls, they actually use some of those ditches for water uh, storage. So they had, um, uh, like they showed in, the, in, the, in some of the pictures that were in the ancient Ohio Trail site, some of the water ponds are actually on the inside uh, of the walls. So perhaps it was just to have uh, a spot for water there. Or possibly they built some of those walls during a time of ongoing outside threat where they felt safer building the, um, the walls from the inside where they're less exposed uh, to threats from the outside. But anyway, those are all possible explanations for why the uh, ditches were inside of the walls and why were these gateways. And I think that that fully addresses the uh, point that sometimes raised to argue that Fort Ancient was not a fort. Obviously it was named Fort Ancient because the people that saw it saw it as clearly a fortification. I wanna talk just a little bit more about what Fort Ancient shows us in terms of the um, the crops and agriculture that were used of the people at that time. So Fort Ancient had gardens and also had large fields um, for planting, which were just outside of, of um, the city, outside of the earthworks. And when they have, they have done some archeological work with that, and they've looked at the soil, they've looked at the seeds, and what they can tell from that is that the Native Americans there had sophisticated farming techniques. And this has overturned one of the key assumptions about Native Americans at that time. Uh, so in particularly in the, in the United States, the Eastern United States, they, like they know the, the Native Americans in Mesoamerica had these large buildings. They know they used uh, maize and so forth, these cities. But the assumptions had all, assumption had always been that in the Eastern United States, there was no large cities, there are hunter gatherers, there's no uh, you know, crops and agriculture. And that has been proven incorrect. And Fort Ancient is one of the key sites where they've proven that incorrect because what they found is in the soil analysis, they found evidence that the fields were burned, the fields were tilled, 
and that there was seed selection to grow more productive plants. And the principal crops that they have found are some unusual ones to us. Uh, in particular, the main one, one of the main ones was a cousin of quinoa that's called goosefoot. They've also found that one of the crops that they used was a cousin of buckwheat, which is now kind of in the wild seen as a weed called a rec knotweed. They also grew a lot of sunflowers, sunflower seeds, squash, grass seeds, and a plant called little barley. So the Book of Mormon refers to barley. Uh, in the So far in the Americas, they haven't found the same variety of barley uh, that was used in the, in the old world. But there is a, a, a cousin called little barley that was used as a crop by these Native Americans in the Book of Mormon timeframes. And these crops were domesticated. So for example, with the goosefoot, the cousin of quinoa, at this point, nobody uses it as a crop, so it's, but it's still found in the wild. And at this point, it's kind of like, well, it's not the greatest crop. But what they've found with, with these storage pits, where they can look at these all of these seeds, they can tell that the, they had been domesticated over extensive periods of time and had developed, you know, they had grown them so that it was thinner skins and larger seeds. So more seed, less skin, a lot better to eat. And, um, and that shows sophisticated domestication where they're doing the seed selection and uh, replanting over, over years and years. And when they looked at some of these seeds that they found that have been stored from that time frame, they've tried to grow some of them. And what they found is that they can actually produce comparable harvests to current major agricultural crops. In, in fact, uh, they estimated potential yields even higher than what you get from modern quinoa, over a thousand pounds of uh, edible seed per per acre. And so there are a few people who've looked at maybe growing goosefoot like quinoa as a as a crop. Okay, so there's an example from one of the the uh, the papers that looked at the the thinner the thinner shells and and larger seeds and go goosefoot compared to quinoa. Okay, so unlike what is commonly assumed, the Native Americans in this Book of Mormon time frame, even in the U.S. Now, again, we know in Mesoamerica that the, that the ones down there had uh, large cities, that they had farming and so forth with a maze. What we found is that even in the eastern United States, in the heartland uh, type area, the Hopewell did have farming and large fields and sophisticated agriculture. In fact, this one says it was um, in the soil, they found these, you know, ragweed pollen percentages. And they said, this is like equivalent to what you would find with extensive European style agriculture. Large fields, annually plowed crops. This implies large occupation sites. This implies cities uh, rather than ceremonial sites. Uh, just like with the DNA evidence, there's clear indications that the people in the heartland were different than uh, the people in Mesoamerica at that time frame. May maize was used as the main thing in Mesoamerica. When the Europeans came over, uh, they found that maize was the dominant crop in um, the United States, uh, the colonies areas at that time. But what the archaeologists archeolo have determined is that it did not become the predominant crop were the Native Americans in the Eastern United States until after Book of Mormon timeframes. There's some a difference in the opinion about when exactly that happened. There's uh, one, this is one of the sites that said that there's no secure sites before 900 AD where maize was used in the Eastern United States, but there's others that say that it was a little bit earlier. Nevertheless, if you're interested in sites, uh, citations from the peer reviewed literature regarding the farming and the crops at Fort Ancient to really test whether that does go against the, the commonly held assumption about the Native Americans there, the, you're welcome to have those. And then let's just very quickly in this last minute or so here, take a look at Google Earth. So if you go to Google Earth, it lets you do a virtual tour of a number of these sites. And over the next several months, as we go through some of these, uh, I'm gonna do videos related to some of these 
uh, archaeological sites that may relate to the Book of Mormon. And I'll use Google Earth for some of it because I'll show you it. Uh, so, so the Fort Ancient was here in the recent search. Um, it'll let you just, uh, in addition to pulling up, you know, pictures and stuff about that, what it'll let you do is really get an interesting view of it. And it can be like being there and maybe even better than being there. So we'll go back out a little bit. <clears throat> so again, this is Northeast of Cincinnati. What you see is the, um, actually I'll go ahead back out a little bit more so you can see that. Okay. So that should pick it up. So here's Cincinnati down here. Up here is uh, Dayton and it's all fits in this area. So we'll go in and uh, this is, like I said, this little Miami River goes down to the Ohio River. So if you go up the Ohio River, up little Miami River and you get to this site, again, this is the, this is the Southern part of the site. This is the Northern part of the site. There's like a, about a mile and a half in between. And as you get in, what it lets you do with Google Earth is you can kind of go in and you can go uh, 3D. And um, and when you get closer with a 3D, you can move it. And uh, it lets you kind of just visualize the whole thing a lot better as you can get an idea of the slopes involved. You can take a close look at it. I want to reset it to north. I don't like it that it. Okay. So you take a look at at the site, and this is the so this is the southern part. This is the the causeway that was built between the two. You can see it's a quite a large site. Here's the museum. So to give you an idea. The the museum is only just a small small little area. You can come up into the the north site, the, the mounds and the that walkway that go out or out that way. Let's go in a little bit closer so you can kind of visualize the walls a little bit here. And uh, you can see it's like, that's a size of a car. So um, anyway, it gets you an idea of the, the size of the walls involved. You can see the, the ditches on the outside. So you can see how they built the ditches to build up the walls as sort of an, a gateway between the two. Many think that there was a, a pickets or some kind of uh, walls on the top. Anyway, it gives you, gives you an idea there. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, stop sharing there. So I wish I could uh, take you there in person. There's nothing beats uh, being at these sites in person, but I hope this will give you the opportunity to much better visualize what these sites look like, look like what these Nephites, what a Nephite city, for example, might look like. I know that it, it helped me. I found it very uh, useful to, to do this kind of stuff. I, I look forward to in the future showing some additional uh, sites and candidates, the best candidates that I see for uh, locations in the Book of Mormon. Uh, if you're interested in these types of videos, please hit like and subscribe, hit the notification button to be notified, please share with others, and that way it will help to um, get this available to others. Thanks.